morning, everyone. How are we doing? <clears throat> we good? We good this morning? Uh, it's so good to. I don't want to cry. It's so good to like to sing about God's goodness and His faithfulness to us. Um, no, I don't know where you're at in life, what's going on in your mind, in your heart, but you can rest in God. You can trust His word. You can trust His goodness and His faithfulness and His mercy. And I. I don't know about you, but I need God every second. I need Jesus every second of every moment of every day in my life. So, um, again, welcome to New Life. Uh, And New New Life, we have a special way of greeting our first-time visitors. So how about we show our first-time guests how we like to greet them. This, this week, we're continuing, we're continuing our series in the solas, um, and as we learned last week, uh, the solas, the five solas are basically their five Latin phrases, and they're meant to provide us with a theological framework uh, in which we can uh, find biblical Christianity. Okay, so primarily, what we're learning in this series um, is we're trying to explain how an infinitely holy God who is not like us can relate to us sinful people. Okay, I don't know if you know this about yourself, uh, but you're a sinner. We all are sinners, right? We're all not perfect people, but God in his grace sent Christ to die for us so that we can spend eternity with our, with our God. Uh, and uh, b- b- before we start, uh, I just want you to know as we, st- as we study things like doctrines and, and beliefs, it can feel very like heady, like very, you know, like knowledge based or just, all, just kind of stuff in our mind. <clears throat> and so I want us to know that Christ alone, it's not only like a foundation for our understanding of God, uh, but it's fuel for our worship of God. OK, and so as we study and we learn and I'm going to I'm not going to lie to you, I'm going to give you a lot of like historical facts today. OK, so just fair warning, uh, just but. It's easy for us to just know information in our mind without it affecting our hearts. Um, So I just pray that, you know, as we look at this and even all of the solos that we're looking at, that we don't simply find information to know, but we just we find more reasons to worship our God because he's been he's been working through people since the beginning. Right. He's been working and working and working and working in this book. These things, they really happen. That's what we believe here. These things really happen. The events, the people, everything in this book is real. So let's pray and let's get started. Father, thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for it. It's so infinite. We don't understand it. We can't. It's incomprehensible. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying and living perfectly for us. Um, Spirit of God, I pray you stir our hearts, stir our minds, stir our eyes. Let us see you more clearly. Um, let us stay focused in, in, your, in your presence, in your spirit, God, uh, so that we can love you better and we can be more like you and we can see how you've been so faithful to your church all these years. Uh, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, okay. So Jesus of Nazareth, um, historically, he's considered one of the most influential people of all time. Okay, uh, and that's just that's by secular standards. It's not like a Christian thing. He's just known. If you Google it, influ- most influential people of all time, Jesus of Nazareth is going to pop up. So therefore, everyone really kind of has an opinion or a belief about Jesus, right? And so, but what's more important than knowing about Jesus and even believing in Jesus is knowing and believing the truth about Jesus, right? And so, this is what the Protestant Reformation, which is what caused these five souls to come about. Uh, this is what it sought to accomplish in the 16th century. That's like in the year 1500, around that time. And so with the doctrine of sol- uh, solus Christus is what it's called, Christ alone. So <clears throat> the reformers fought to revive the truth uh, and spread the truth of the gospel of Jesus, both in the church and outside the church. And I know we might be thinking, okay, wait a minute, why are we talking about something that happened 500 years ago that doesn't really matter, that doesn't apply to my life? But we have to understand that the only, one of the only reasons um, that we can know and believe the truth about uh, Jesus from a historical perspective is because of what happened there 500 years ago. Uh, They provide us with the foundation of knowing and being saved by Christ. And so what exactly is Christ alone there in your outline? Christ alone essentially means that Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, meaning that's God in the flesh, um, that Jesus Christ and his work, his perfect life and sacrificial death is the only way to reconcile our broken relationship with God and be saved from God's righteous judgment reserved for sin. So nothing can be or should be added to Jesus' work for our salvation. 
okay? Uh, and nor can anybody else, no one on this earth can stand between us and God and mediate a relationship, okay? And so as much as our family, our friends, our church leaders, as much as whoever it is may love us, no one can say it can make us right with God. Of course, people can guide us, people can help us, people can show us and point us to the truth, but no one can stand and say, I declare you righteous. No one can do that but Jesus, okay? And so he's the only one that can determine our innocence in the eyes of God. And by God's grace, man, we, we know this now and we can believe this now, but this wasn't the case 500 years ago. And we're, we're about to see kind of what happened. So, so how did all this stuff start here? So um, Acts 4, chapter 4, verse 12, I think it's in your outline. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, how about you, you uh, read it with me? It says, uh, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Let's read it again. I, th I think you can read it so I can drink some water. So let's do that. So you guys are read it. Ready? One, two, three. There is. So after witnessing firsthand the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Peter, who spoke these words, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He boldly proclaimed these words to about Jesus to the same Jews and religious leaders who just had Jesus killed, okay? And because Jesus was teaching the same thing about himself. And so Peter wasn't like a scholar or a trained theologian, but he just had a pure and deep faith rooted in Jesus' words of, in, in John 4, 14, 6, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Peter believed that. He believed that. And so you see, we see here that this doctrine of Christ alone, that eternal salvation is only possible through Jesus and his saving work, it was taught by Jesus, and it was carried on by his disciples over the years. Uh, and it was in the New Testament you see that happen, and then in the early church we see this happen. And so it became the central theology of the Christian faith. Uh, and it, it was used to uh, d preach the gospel, and it was used to defend, it was used to defend, advance the gospel and defend the gospel. So... Uh, but as the church progressed over the centuries, some things happened that caused the church to get a little bit off course. Okay, and that's what I want to show you kind of what happened. Let's point a few things out. Uh, if you like history, man, you're going to love this. If you don't like history, I hope you still love this. But it's just stuff. Uh, I, I, I pray that God just like do something in you as you as we go through this. Because this is, you know, sometimes we can see Christianity and the Bible is like, oh, it's just something outside, something spiritual. It's something, you know, abstract. But this, all this stuff is like in, is intertwined in history, in real life stuff. Okay, like the people here, this really happened. All this stuff is real. Uh, and, it, and that's why we know that this is the word of God. But anyway, let me, keep, let, me, uh, let me go. So, uh, so when Peter spoke these words in Acts 12, that Jesus is the only way for salvation, um, he revived, essentially, the gospel of Jesus. So the Jews hoped when, they, when he was killed, when Jesus was killed, everyone, like the Jews and some of the Roman people, they were like, man, we hope we can just shut this message up of Jesus. Let's, let's just suppress it. Let's get it down. Let's, let's forget about it. So we kill him. The, revolution, Jesus, the Jesus revolution dies. But when, when Peter said this, he, he essentially revived this truth that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And so, yes, this upset the Jews at the time, but eventually it upset the Roman Empire. Okay, You have to understand that the Roman Empire was essentially the superpower at the time. Right, They were on top of the world uh, in, in history, they were, and they sought to crush anyone or anything that was trying to come against them, right? Anything that opposed their authority, anything that opposed their power, uh, Rome would come out and just stomp them out. And so, but as Jesus' disciples were faithfully preaching the gospel, more and more Roman citizens were becoming Christians. And as more and more citizens became Christians, then there was more power in the Christian church, okay? And now also, as more and more people, were, more and more Roman citizens were becoming Christians, that meant less and less people were worshiping the Roman gods, okay? And so, and again, now Rome was like, if we see anything as a threat, we're about to just stomp this out. And so that's what they did. They made Christianity illegal. They made Christianity illegal for, for 250 years, and they violently persecuted the church. I mean, we're talking, if they, if they found out that you're a Christian, you were probably going to get beaten, thrown in jail. A lot of people were killed from this. Um, and, you know, here today, you know, in Galveston, Texas, we, thank God, we don't really have to worry about that in our time. We can freely express our faith. Um, but, man, during this time, if you were a Christian, that's a no-go. And now I do want us to be aware of the fact that around the world, this still happens to this very day. 
um, in, it's like especially in like in China, this is this, there's like a big revolution in China right now going on with 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 Christianity, and in the Middle East you have people uh, that are like very radical religious people who are killing a lot of uh, Christians. So this stuff is r still happening, although we might not be experiencing it. There's brothers and sisters around the world that because they say I'm a Christian, they're facing some intense persecution. Okay, so uh, thank God that you know we don't have to handle that at this moment in our time in history, uh, but that should give us more confidence and more boldness to go out and actually live this out. So, um, so again, they were violently persecuted, and this went on for about 250 years. Okay, so then around the year 312, there was a Roman emperor that came to power, and his name was Constantine. And uh, by everyone's surprise, he turned Christian. He converted to Christianity. And then a year later, he passed the law and said, hey, you know what? Let's stop persecuting Christians. Christian, it's legal now. It's okay. We're, we're going to tolerate Christianity. And then another but in the year 325, a couple years after that, he actually formed like the first council where all the Christian leaders could, would come together and they're going to define the core beliefs about the Christian faith. They're going to say, this is what we believe as Christians. And because there was a lot of beliefs about Christians at the time, but it was very unorganized still. And so like, no, we don't believe this. We don't believe this. We don't. This is what we believe. And they went and they defined that. They defined what that looked like. And so then, around, a couple years later, there was another emperor in the year 380, Theodosius. You want to say something cool? Say Theodosius. <laughs> Theodosius. Now you know a Roman emperor. There you go. And so the, in 380, the emperor Theodosius, he made Christianity the official Roman religion, and that is how the Roman Catholic Church was officially born. Okay. And so it was called the Catholic Church because the word Catholic means universal or all-encompassing. So as the Roman Catholic Church, it was meant to be a universal church for all the Christians. This is the one church that unified all of the Christians. Nowadays, we Catholic Church for us is more of like a denomination. But back then, it wasn't seen that way. It was seen as the one church that unified all the Christians in the Roman, in the Roman Empire. And since Rome was so powerful... And they had so much influence, uh, it remained the headquarters of the church. And it gave the church a lot of power, and it gave the church a lot of influence. So now, this is like the first 400 years or so of Christianity. And while all this was really good news for the Christians, they're like, yes, we can finally express our faith freely. We can preach freely. We can, bring, we can train disciples. We can do these things. There were consequences that came from fusing a, like, a non-Christian empire with a relatively new Christianity. There's some stuff that happened there. And so we're going to fast forward about a thousand or so years. So <laughs> welcome, guys, to the year 1500. We are in the year 1500 now. Okay. And so what happened in the year 1500 was the Roman Catholic Church became very, uh, let me just say this. Uh, I, I'm, for one thing, we're, I'm, this whole series is not about bashing any particular denomination. Let me just say that first and foremost. Uh, secondly, I know a lot of us are probably were, or we, we know a lot of family that was very influenced by the Catholic Church. You know, obviously, I, I've told this before, I grew up uh, Roman Catholic as well. And so this isn't a bashing, this isn't an attack on anybody or anything. What I'm aiming to do with these, it's just state historical facts. That's all I'm doing. I, I, I'm not trying to embed any opinion in here. I'm just trying to say what happened. And this history is like, just if you search history of this, this is what you're going to find. I'm not giving any particular side of, of the argument here, okay? So fast forward to 1500. Again, we're in the year 1500. So it became very politicized, very powerful. Um, the high level clergy, they were just all about like earning and keeping relationships with governments, because they liked the idea of expanding the, the Catholic Church in that way. Okay, they wanted to expand their power. <clears throat> and so, but because of this, some things happened, and like, man, a lot of corruption infiltrated the church, okay? Instead of, of spirit-empowered love and generosity and serving and evangelism, the operating motives of the church had become Rome-enabled greed and power and authority. Uh, and so the church really shifted. And this didn't mean that all Roman Catholics at the time were corrupt. It just meant that at this moment in history, the Catholic Church was, the Roman Catholic Church was generally known as a corrupt institution. Now, understand, this was the same church that, that Jesus initiated when he was here. So 1500, later, 1,500 years later, it came from Jesus to this point here. And so let me just tell you a few quick things about the, the corruption that was going on. Um, as we learned last week, uh, scripture was corrupted, it, and in that it was, uh, it was kept in, the, in Latin. It was kept in the language of Latin. <clears throat> and so it wasn't readable by regular people. It would be like if 
The only Bible that pastor taught from was from a Chinese Bible because he knew Chinese for some reason. And nobody else knew Chinese. And he was like, this is what it says. And like, you'd be like, okay, you know, I, I, if that's what you say, then that's what you say. Uh, so they kept it in Latin, and it wasn't, it wasn't readable by regular people. And so only like the very educated people and only like religious scholars could actually read it so that nobody could really hold the church accountable for their doctrine. Nobody could hold the church accountable for what they were saying and teaching. And so by keeping people ignorant, by keeping them in, in the dark about what was going on, it really just gave the church more and more power. Okay, and it made it, and they actually made it punishable by death to translate the Bible into the regular language. That's how much they wanted to keep this to themselves. Uh, secondly, uh, the church leadership got a little corrupt. You know, the, the, it's called simony is a thing, and it was basically when the the offices of the church were sold to the highest bidder. So this really benefited a lot of the rich people who were. They really wanted to get power over people, so they'd be like, hey, I'll pay you, I'll pay the church X amount of dollars, and you give me the position of priest over this, or you give me the position of bishop over all these churches, and I'll, you know, I'll, give, you, I'll give you this money. And so, uh, they, like I said, they wanted to buy power over people because the people were really trained to believe that it was only through the church and it was only through the people in the church that salvation was, was achieved. And uh, that, that's how... That was like prevalent in all of Rome. And so because there was a lot of lead church leaders that weren't actually like, just, they didn't really want to be like godly people. They just wanted power. Man, there was a lot of immorality and a lot of sinfulness that was going on by a lot of the priests and a lot of the clergy. And then the, the, the third thing, this is the final third thing, um, that was kind of like issues of corruption was that um, the church relied, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the church called people to rely on Jesus for salvation but plus the sacraments and all the traditions of the church. Like not only, yes, yeah, they would affirm Jesus Christ, they would, but they would also affirm that you have to do this as well. You have to follow these particular sacraments. You have to follow these particular traditions that we believe. Um, and that's how you would be saved. And uh, they also called the, the people to rely, like you had to rely on the priest. You had to rely on the pope as the only and final authority. You had to rely on the saints. You had to rely on Mary. And those are the people that mediated the relationship between us and God. And that's what the people were trained. And so, so to deal with sin, if you, if you had sinned, the process would be, uh, norm, well, we know now we come to Jesus, we confess our sin, and we confess it to people, and then we know that we can find forgiveness and healing as we do that. And, but the way that it was taught in the year 1500 was, okay, you have to go to a priest, and it has to be a priest. You have to go there to the church. You have to confess your sin to the priest, and then the priest would tell you what you need to do, and then you would have to do whatever they said, whether it's like go say this prayer a few times, go to a certain mass or, or church services, we call it, go to a, like on a pilgrimage or do go give alms, go give money or something like that. They would tell you what to do in order for you to be restored back to a Christian so that you could uh, be received, be considered, I guess, uh, a clean or pure, restored Christian. So now, this is where things get a little, a little uh, interesting, I guess, for lack of a, of a better word. So <clears throat> in place of actually going and doing the things that the priests were telling them to do, like if, they, if you came to the priest and you said, okay, um, I did this, so what, is my, what do I need to do? They'll tell you, okay, you do this. And they'll be like, oh, I don't think I really either A, want to do that, or B, I really can't do that for whatever reason. They, the church was selling these certificates, and they were called indulgences, okay? And so these could be purchased, and they were signed by the Pope, and what they did basically was they removed the penalty or the punishment that you would have to pay for doing that sin. So it wasn't really like it wasn't meant to be marketed this way, but it was essentially what it was, was you were buying salvation is what it was. You were buying forgiveness of your sins. And that was, that upset, I mean, a lot of people, but nobody could say anything, nobody could do anything because the church was like, they were so powerful. I mean, I'm telling you, these people were like, as, as powerful as like the Roman Empire. Um, so essentially, you know, they were, you could buy your salvation and man, this, and this, was, this led to a lot of abuse, so people didn't really care themselves with trying to live according to God's word, because they were like, uh, I'll just go buy an indulgence, and I can just live how I want to live. And so this was getting very abused, and so the church would send out 
these people to go on crusades and like they would come like as if they were in a carnival and they say hey hey they would send somebody ahead before the person arrived and say hey in, in a couple of hours there's going to be a guy coming he's going to be selling indulgences and you can find forgiveness for your sins by buying one of these things so go get your money go get everything that you need ready and and we'll be we'll be here in two hours and they'll come and they'll say hey everybody we're selling indulgences you ready come on come in line and they would sell all these indulgences, and, and it got to a point where they were actually doing it for, like, dead relatives, and it got really, like, weird, like, what's going on here? And so, and then what was really crazy is that some of the church leaders who got in debt for buying a high position, they would actually send these people out on crusades to sell indulgences so they can raise money to pay back their debt that they got from buying their position. And so there was just, like, so much stuff going on, and, and now, now while all this was happening— well, so keep that, keep that, put that in your mind right here for right now. While all of this was happening, there was um, a, a man named Martin Luther, and he was studying to become a lawyer. And he was from Germany, uh, and he was raised in a very strict home, uh, and it was they, the, his home valued education, and it also valued the Roman Catholic tradition. And so he is, as he grew up, he realized that if you fail, you have to pay for it. There has to be some punishment that you're going to receive. And so as a kid, I guess he tended to fail a lot. And so his dad punished him a lot. And his dad actually punished him pretty severely. And he would also get punished a lot by his teachers. So this man, Martin Luther, was constantly aware of his sin. He was constantly aware of his shortcomings. And he knew in his heart that he was always guilty. He always felt guilty. He always felt like God didn't love him. God would not accept him because his parents didn't love him and his parents didn't. They loved him, don't get me wrong, but because they punished him, he always felt that he was never enough is probably the best way to say it. And so with all this going on in his mind, him, him thinking that the only way to be right is to pay for something yourself, um, one day there was a violent thunderstorm that was going on, and uh, he, he was thrown to, thrown to the ground by a bolt of lightning, and he prayed to a saint because that's all he knew to do, and he believed that the saint kind of saved him. And so he believed that essentially God spared his life, so he said, I vow my life to become a monk. So he became a monk, and he didn't just become like a regular monk. He became like a very intense monk, a very radical monk. He would spend hours and hours in confession. He was constantly praying, constantly fasting. And he got to the point in his life as a monk where he was actually, he would go and sleep out in the cold with no blanket. He would go and he would deprive himself of sleep, and he would actually physically harm himself. Just, oh, he did all of this he was trying to take the punishment for his sin because he realized that he wasn't pure before God, but he was doing all these things so in hopes that God would accept him and hope that he could be pure and righteous for God. But we know now, thanks, thanks to God and in his word, that Jesus took all the punishment that we deserve for us. Luther was right in understanding that, we need, that there is payment that is necessary for sin, because there is, because it's an offense against God. But that's why he sent Jesus to pay all that punishment and take all of that punishment for us. He did that for us. And man, man, we know ourselves. We know our sin. We know what goes on in our minds and our hearts. But Jesus did this for us anyways. Jesus loves you and he cares about you. And there's forgiveness available for you. There's forgiveness. You can be forgiven any moment, any time. You can have a right relationship with God because of Jesus. And so, again, Luther, he just, he didn't know this, though. He just knew that I had to pay, and I just don't know if God, if I'm going to be accepted by God. And he actually was quoted saying, if I believed that God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. He just had this perpetual feeling of, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I'm not worthy, and I'm not enough, and I'm never going to be enough for God. And I have to do all these things in order for God to accept me. And even then, I don't know if he's going to accept me. I just hope that he does. And this was going on. Now, this, his work ethic caused him to be known as a very successful, very good monk. Um, however, he was a little, little too much for his leaders, and his leaders were like, oh, man, you're a little too intense for us. So how about you go to a university, and you can go study, and you can go teach the Bible over there. So they kind of got him out, and he went and he taught the Bible. But interestingly, um, it was actually through reading and through studying and through teaching the scriptures for himself that he realized, he, he started to realize, like, like man, I don't think the church is actually following and adhering to what the Bible says. 
right? And that's kind of, that was a, that was a big deal. I mean, because again, remember the church was immensely powerful and had so much authority. And so he, would, he, he did teachings on Psalms. He went two years. He taught through the book of Psalms. He taught through the book of Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And then um, after reading verses like Romans 117 that says uh, that we are, uh, the righteous shall live by faith. And after reading verses like Matthew 27, 46, where Jesus is on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, Luther, his eyes began to open to the pure and the true gospel for what it is. And so um, after meditating days and night on the word of God and trying to understand it by God's grace, uh, Luther finally realized that being made right with God is not something that is achieved through works, but it is received through faith in Christ. It wasn't achieved through works. It was received through faith in Christ. And he realized that when, when Jesus died on the cross, that he took our place to absorb all the punishment of God upon himself for us. Because, man, we, we, we deserve punishment as, as sinners, but because Jesus took all the punishment for us. He did that for us. And, and Luther started to realize that, and in exchange, he, he's like, wait, and then he's realized, man, in exchange for all of my sinfulness, God gave me his Christ gave me his perfection so that when God sees us, he can be seen as righteous, be seen as perfect before God. Also, we can have a personal relationship with God and to his glory. Uh, and Luther said here, I felt as if I were entirely born again. It had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. Here, this was the same man who, if you saw him, you'd be like, oh, man, you know this guy's going to heaven. Look at the life he's living. He's so strict. He tries so hard. He's so good. He's doing everything that he can. And in his own heart, he didn't, he didn't realize that he, was st- that wasn't, he wasn't saved he, because it's only through faith in what Christ did is where salvation lies. And now all of this theology, man, this stuff, it, went, it, went a, it was opposed to the church. And so, uh, as one author put it, he said, the, implication of, the implications of Luther's discovery were enormous. He said, if salvation comes through faith in Christ alone, the intercession of priests is superfluous, like it's, it's not necessary. So faith, formed and nurtured by the word of God, written and preached, requires no monks, no masses, and no prayers to the saints. The mediation of the church of Rome crumbles into insignificance. So you can tell, man, this was a very big deal to the church because this was their entire operation crumbling to insignificance is what he was saying. And so if Luther was understanding the scriptures, um, if, if what he was understanding was true, then the Roman Catholic Church had no ability to mediate between us and God because all that was only possible through Jesus. That's what he was realizing. And so he tried, now, through a ton of events that we don't have time to to go through, uh, Martin Luther, he formally protested the church um, through the church, but they rebuked him and they excommunicated him and they considered him to be a criminal. Um, now, know this, he wasn't trying to, like, start a new denomination, a Christian denomination. He wasn't trying to separate from the church. He was just trying, he just wanted to bring the church back into alignment with what the scriptures said. That's what he wanted to do. But the church, unfortunately, didn't want to reform. And so Luther was quoted saying, well, he was basically, he was saying, well, if I'm going to have to follow either what you say or what God's word says, I'm going to follow what God's word says, and I think that's probably the, his, the best choice there. And so for the remainder of his life, uh, you know, Luther, he was like basically living, hiding from the, from the Catholic Church who essentially wanted to kill him. And, and it was there that he wrote some theological books, but his most important contribution probably to the church was that he translated the entire Bible into the common language, which was German. And so now all the people in Germany had the word of God at their, in, their, in their hands. They could read it, and they could see for themselves what was true and what was real. And so uh, I'll just summarize everything here with these two points. Um, let's, let's look at uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. <clears throat> it says, Therefore there is one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. I read it again. So there is one God and one mediator between God, between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. So these, these final two points here, the first one is uh, Jesus, he's the exclusive Savior. 
He's our exclusive Savior. Uh, God, Christ alone means that Jesus is the only person who can mediate our relationship with God. Now, basically, a mediator is a person who goes in between two parties or two people, and he represents both of them. He sees, and, and he comes, and he tries to bring, he or she tries to bring peace. And so, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, he was the only one that was truly qualified to represent both God and both man. Now, because everybody who's ever been born is a sinner, no one, no one qualifies to hand out righteousness. No one can do that. Jesus is the only one who can do that faithfully because, A, he was God, and, B, he, was, he represented man as well. And so uh, no one can declare us innocent before God by their own authority because every person to have ever existed is a sinner and is therefore not qualified to give to others what they themselves they don't possess. Man, none of us are perfect. That's, that's basically it. None of us are perfect, but Jesus is. None of us are perfect, but Jesus is. And because of his perfection, we can receive his perfection through faith, which we'll, all, which we'll look at later in, in the next, next coming weeks. So Jesus is the only one who is able to stand between, between us and God. We, we don't, again, we don't rely on anybody or anything. We don't rely on our good life. We don't rely on our... Some of us... We think we're so bad that we can't be forgiven. We think that we're so far gone that we can't be forgiven. But it's not our, what we do that determines our salvation. It's, who, it's what Jesus did for us. And our, we place all of our faith, we put all of our trust, we put all of our hope, we put everything in him because he's the only one who's worthy. He's the only one who's able to save us. He's the only one who's able to do it because he qualifies to do it. And, and just the second thing there, <clears throat> Jesus is the sufficient Savior. He's a sufficient Savior. I'm going to drink water because I'm thirsty. Christ alone means that the work of Jesus, man, the work of Jesus is our only hope. It's our only hope for salvation, for eternal salvation. And to add, man, to add anything to what Jesus did, to think that anything that we do is earning us salvation is really to subtract from what Jesus did for us. Anything, if we add something to Jesus' work, we basically subtract from it. Man, Christ alone, he's our only hope for salvation. He's all that we have. He's all, he's all that we can cling to, and that's why we sing about Jesus, and that's why we worship Jesus, and that's why we try to be like Jesus, because he's the one, he's the only one. He's, he came from God. He's the eternal son of God, the second member of the Trinity. He came down, and he became man, and he lived perfectly because we couldn't live perfectly, and then he died sacrificially because our sins had to be paid for. And then he rose, and when he rose, that, his, that proves, obviously, that God accepted his his offering. So his perfect life is enough to satisfy the demands of God's law, basically, that we need to live perfect. And his sacrificial death is enough to satisfy the demands of God's justice, that sin has to be dealt with. You know, it, it has to be paid for. So, man, if you are already saved here in this place, like if you believe that in, in what Christ, not if simply if you just believe G in Jesus, you know, there's many people that can, there's a difference between like, you know, believing, you know, yeah, I believe Jesus existed, you know, as a person. There's a difference between like believing in him and putting all your faith and all your hope and all your trust and everything in him. Like, are you banking on him for your everything? There's a difference. There's a difference. And so if you if you just believe in him, like, oh yeah, I just want to be like Jesus. I just want to love like, like Jesus. But, but have you put your, all your faith in what he did for you? If you've done that and you, you know you be, and you believe that you're that you're saved, man, value that, value that. That Christ, man, God, God knew before Christ died. God knew what we were going to do. He knew our sinfulness. He knew our sin, our sinful tendencies. He knew what, what we were going to do wrong. He knew that we were going to fail Him and that we we're going to continue to fail Him. But even in spite of all that, He still sent His Son Christ, and Jesus voluntarily came and said, "Yes, I'll give my life for them because I love them and I want them to have a relationship with Me because I'm the one who created them. I'm the one who was they were meant to be with. I'm the one who I want to be be with them for eternity." Jesus did that. 
I pray, man, that if you if you know Christ, that you never, 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 never lose the awe, never lose the wonder, never, never let your heart grow hard. Uh, let it always be soft and sensitive to what God has done for us. Because, man, it can be so easy to be like, yeah, I know that. That's the gospel. Okay. But like I said earlier, I pray that stuff doesn't, doesn't just go in our mind, but it affects our hearts to where, man, I can't be the same. And Christ did that for me. I know myself. I can't live the same. And, um, man, in the... And, and man, the only way, the only way really to live for Jesus is to live from Jesus. You know, that's really the only way to live. And you might be thinking like, well, then if, if all of our faith is in Christ alone and his work, then why do I need to work? What do I need? What do I need to do? It's like when you realize that he did everything, you want to do everything, too. That's when you know you're like when you're there's um, I was talking with 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 dude the other day and we were just we were just. I don't know. We were just talking, <laughs> and uh, and it got to a, a point where we were like, man, you you know, uh, I think we were talking about our teachings or something like that, and uh, and we were saying that uh, um, I I don't know if any of you guys are fans of the show Friends. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like okay. There was there was like several episodes on there where there's a girl and she was like. I don't want my boyfriend to do something for me. I want him to want to do something for me, you know, like, and we we're just saying like, yeah, you know, I think God's kind of the same way in the sense that he doesn't just want us to serve him. He wants us to want to serve him, right? He wants us to want to live for him. And, uh, the, and the only way that you do that in purity is by knowing that he's, man, he's done everything for you. You have to be captivated by his love and his mercy, and his grace, and you're just like, I can't be the same. Look what he did for me. Yeah, I know life's not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm still going to go through things. Life's still going to be hard, but he's faithful. He's good, and he's my rock, and I'm going to stand, and I'm going to cling to that cross, because that's all I have in this life is him, and him alone, Christ alone. He's our Savior. He's our hope. He's our life. He's our light. He shows us everything that we need. He gives us everything that we that we need, not necessarily everything that we want, but he gives us everything that we need in life to live for him and to honor him so do you want to live for God or do we do you feel like oh it's just something I have to do because hopefully God sees that I tried really hard and maybe he'll give me some grace some of that grace and mercy that everybody talks about it's knowing that man he's given in spite of it all of that he's like I've given you everything you have access to the fullness of God in Christ everything you have access to it value your salvation value it and maybe you're here and you and you don't know. You're like, when? Man, dude, I don't know. I, now you got me thinking. I don't really know. You know? Maybe you're like, I'm, I'm not too sure now. Do, am I? Am I saved? Am I? Am I? I don't. I don't know. Well, I don't know either. But I, all I know is that if you put your faith and your hope, all of it in Christ, you can be. You can be forgiven today. You can be forgiven today. You can. You can leave here in the joy and in the confidence of knowing that God. He loves you immensely, and that he's pleased with you because as he see, when he sees you, he sees the perfection of his son on you. The Bible tells us in, in Colossians 3, I love this verse, it says that our lives are hidden in Christ. And I love the image of the prodigal son when, when the son ran to the father, and the father, he didn't tell him to go get cleaned up, but he put his robe, which is considered God's robe of righteousness, he put his robe and covered his sin, he covered it. Yeah. Jesus covered it. He covered your sin. All your sin can be covered. And as we're singing, what can, what can wash away our sins? What can do it? What can make us whole? What can make us white as snow? What can make us pure? Nothing but Jesus and his blood, his sacrifice for us. That's what we cling to. We cling to Jesus. He's our Savior. He's the only one. He's exclusive. He's the only one. There's nobody else that can determine. No one can come to you and say, I declare you as righteous. Nobody can do that but Jesus. No one can do that. Um, so, if you, if, again, if you're saved, value it. If you're, if you're not, trust in him. Trust in him. Um, I, I, I know, uh, I'm sure a lot of us... Uh, or have been, have been or are, you know, kind of been involved with like maybe Catholicism to some degree, right? I don't know. I know I grew up, like I said, I grew up, you know, Roman Roman Catholic. And again, this wasn't an attack. This, this is not an attack on the church. This is not an attack on anybody in particular. But the Christianity that we believe, it did branch off from that as, as 
as it were, basically. And uh, because we don't believe that we have to go through any particular person, any particular priest, any particular saint or any like statue or anything. We, we, we don't have to do that because Christ told us, the Bible tells us, as we just read, Jesus is the one mediator between us. He's the one who mediates between us and God. And, uh, my man, just my, my hope and prayer is just again that um, that you that you see that Jesus is your everything, and He's 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 your everything. And uh, you know, I don't know what you're going through, and life's not going to always be, feel like it's going well. You might not feel like God loves you. You might not feel like God cares about you, you might feel that God has forgotten you, but remember what Jesus did for you, and that's always applicable to your life. He's always there for you. He's always with you, and His Spirit is always there, so let's pray. Father, thank you for your infinite wisdom. Thank you for your perfect word. Jesus, thank you for coming and, and dying and to make us new, to make us new people. We can find our hope. We can find new life. And it is only through you. It is only through what you've done, your perfect life, your perfect death, all for us, so that we can have a personal relationship with you and that we can spend eternity with you, both in starting now and, and forever. God, I pray that our hearts not grow hard. I pray that we not grow grow bitter, that we not grow tired of doing good, that we not grow tired of serving you, of loving you. I pray that you encourage any discouraged hearts tonight, today, this morning, Lord. I pray that you lift up any spirits that are downcast, anybody who's dealing with uh, anything in their mind, depressions, or any anything that situations at home and work with friends, family, whatever it may be. God, I pray that you show yourself faithful, you show yourself good, you sh- and that you bring your reality and your presence to everyone here in their lives, wherever they're at. Spirit of God, I pray that you apply the words of God to the hearts of the people wherever they're at in their life. I pray that you show them, God, that that your word is the ultimate authority and that you, Jesus, are the only one who can stand and count us as righteous. And if we believe in what you've done for us and that we trust and we put all our hope in in who you are and what you've done, that we can have the joy of knowing that we are going to be with you and that you are in us and that we are in you and that we are united united with you, and then our old life is gone, our old life is hidden, that you don't count that against us, everything is covered by the blood of Christ, and we thank you, we thank you so much, so Spirit of God, I pray that you not let us be the same, let us not be the same people, thank you for, thank you for your word, thank you for your presence in Jesus' name, amen, thank you, thank you guys.